Okay guys, we're here at the Shroud of Turin exhibit in Jerusalem. And I, I just felt after watching this exhibit, it's something I really wanted to share with you guys. So uh, you can see here, uh, this is not the original Shroud of Turin. This is an example of it. We have the crown of thorns here, the nails, uh, the whips. We're gonna show you this uh, exhibit here in Jerusalem. If anybody is interested, this is at a, uh, the Notre Dame Church close to the new gate. But let's look at the exhibit. Okay, at the Shroud of Turin exhibit, we're here at a church called uh, Notre Dame. And um, within this church, many people don't know about this exhibit, but you can see right here, we have the, oh, it's backwards, Shroud exhibit. So we're gonna go inside, so let's, um, Take a look inside. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go through this exhibit, guys. We're gonna have a lot of reading. Um, here is, this, this one is called, it's not all in the screen there, but who is the man of the shroud? What is known today of the Shroud of Turin is a linen cloth, um, 14 feet, three inches by three feet, seven inches. We're gonna go through a lot of these details, guys. And um, I'm, I know a lot of you might be quite skeptical about this and that's okay but let's just look at the evidence um we're just um doing this exhibit this is not the actual location of the shroud of course i believe it's in turin but there's um there's things here that i i was so impressed upon that i felt it was important to share so we're going to go through some of the history first because it the, the reason you might wonder how how is this you know this linen cloth, how is this possible that this could still be available in our day? So we're gonna go through the exhibit. We have a lot of reading, so bear with us, but it's very important to uh, share with you all the details on the shroud, okay? Now, the first thing you might be wondering is how is it possible the shroud is, you know, existed, you know, what, it, what is its history? Um, here's a simple map on the history, of course, uh, starting in Jerusalem, and there are records of it uh, being in existence in other places like modern-day Turkey, uh, Istanbul, Athens, um, and then these other places um, that we can look at um, over here. So this exhibit, um, this part of the exhibit describes the um, location, okay? So unlike most other venerated options, the Shroud Return has been the subject of intense multidisciplinary research for a century now. Its authenticity has been intensely debated by scientists, historians. Um, the shroud can be traced back to 1349 in Lyre, France. So that's one of the locations we just showed you on the map. Um, then purported the Shroud of Christ appeared under mysterious circumstances. Okay, 1355, a French knight arranged its first public Exposition in the modern modern church of Lyrie. Okay, his wife and great-granddaughter led the uh, sack of Constantinople in 1240. It immediately began to draw large numbers of pilgrims in 1453. His granddaughter um, traded the shroud for two castles. Okay. Um, I hope I'm getting all this. I'm sorry if I'm not getting all this in the screen, guys. I'm reading it and holding the camera. Okay, then we have the Pope acknowledge his personal belief um, that the shroud was real in the burial cloth of Jesus. All right, uh, 1463 and, okay, 1532, a fire in this chapel damaged the shroud, reportedly dropped the molten silver from the containing, container, fell on the linen, so it damaged it, okay, partly destroying the fabric. This explains the symmetrical um, repetition of some peculiar triangle holes, okay, um, that we can see. We'll see that throughout this, okay? All right, so then we got nuns in 1534, uh, uh, did some sewing, okay, and some patches. Then we have 1578, the shroud was moved to Turin so that the cardinal intended to make the pilgrims on foot to see it and spared a journey over the Swiss Alps except for a period during World War II when it was hidden in the Abbey of, in Italy, okay? So we're just gonna move through this quickly. This is just some of the history. I encourage you to um, do some more research on this if you're skeptical of, of these paths. We're gonna look at them though. All right, so then we got 1946 and 
it went to the Vatican in 1983. Four centuries of control, the shroud was in the House of Savoy. The shroud's history before uh, 1350 was at the first sight rather obscure. There's no evidence of Erkov during the first couple of centuries in Christian era. Still, history is totally silent on the possible preservation of Christ's burial cloth. Okay, and now this is important, guys. All right, in Byzantine art, the beginning of the sixth century, Christ was frequently represented with details resembling the Shroud of Turin. Um, scientific study of this unique archaeological subject has been going on for a century now, and it really began in 1898. When the cloth, uh, let's get a good view here, when the cloth was photographed for the first time, and, you know, then it was shared, okay, um, and we're going to look at some of these details throughout the exhibit. Let's talk about this. The first photograph of the shroud marked a turning point in its history, began a fascination period of scientific research on the shroud. It is fair to say that since then, probably no object has been, um, uh, has been subjugated to such extents, extensive multidisciplinary research as the shroud. Okay. Let's see, we're a controversial dating of the shroud um, by carbon testing, etc. Okay, at any rate, when the scientific results obtained to the date, well, let's, we're gonna, uh, all right, let's kind of move on here and go to um, some other things about the, uh, the history and the other um, interesting things here. What you can do is if you're interested in, you know, you can, you can pause the video and read all this, but for time's sake, we're going to move to the other descriptions. Okay, look at this picture, guys. All right. Uh, precious miniature from the Byzantine Chronicler manuscript, uh, transfer of the holy face of Christ from Edessa, this is uh, Turkey, to the emperor Constantinople in August 19, or excuse me, in August year A.D. 944. The head of Christ is seen um, drawn on a long cloth. Okay, so see the face here? All right, there's a face there and then there's a cloth. So this is um, an example of the shroud, you know, being in Constantinople. And then here again, they're, they're showing this. This is exactly what the shroud looks like as Christ laid his arms crossed. Okay, um, this is called the Pre Codex manuscript from Hungary, depicts uh, the hands of Christ cross and the four fingers visible in each hand on the shroud. And, okay, this one, year 1150. Ambassadors of Hungary were shown the imperial treasures, including the royal burial cloth of Christ in Constantinople. So this is dated 1192 and 1195, okay? So this is some of the history. All right, an icon. Again, um, we have a, a, sh a shroud and they're putting a face on it. All right, an icon dated 945 AD, pers preserved in St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. Okay, so in, in Sinai, they're describing this. Okay, and since the 14th century, the shroud has been often depicted to the public. A rare weave of the shroud is depicted in 1348 on a uh, lead pilgrim's. Uh, badge of liar preserved in the museum in France. Okay, so that's some of its history from Jerusalem to France. Okay, here's some of the history once the Vatican um, obtained it. This picture here is showing the Pope and is showing uh, the shroud there. Okay, so then they had it. Um, and what do we have here? This is more of the, um, you know, kind of European time frame, 1559 here, um, 1534 there. Some of the damage that was done of the repairs in the patches. Okay, so there were some patches from that fire that uh, we mentioned. Okay, this plaque is showing the beginning of the research. Okay, so this is the photograph, first photograph taken. Um, this is a negative, um, and this is a positive of the image um, of each of them. Okay. Um, and we're going to uh, see some 
a lot of information on this. This is just, um, you know, as we go, we'll see a lot of these, but these are the patches. These sections here, see the triangles? So it was folded over. And again, these are all replicas. We don't have the shroud actually here. Okay, in this uh, exhibit guide, we're gonna read this and we're going to um, show you um, a lot of these uh, displays here. This one is very, very important. No matter how good a normal uh, photograph of any three-dimensional 3D object can only produce it in two dimensions. The image on the shroud displays the light and dark characteristics that are normally observed in photographic ne negative. This is discovered in 1988 when they took the first photographs of the shroud. In their grayscale, all variations from light to dark. The photographic images contain a representation of the distance between the cloth and the face of the original 3D body. That is, a grayscale of photos of the shroud provide us an extraordinary 3D encoding of the body. Color photographs do not contain this 3D information. So a normal photograph cannot produce 3D. Holography consists of the tracing and reproducing or playback of a 3D image. The playback provides an image in light that can be viewed from different angles and is an exact copy of the original 3D object. Not having had access to the original shroud, second and third generation copies of the original photographs made um, in 1931 were used. They were digitized to facilitate uh, transition of the image density information into grayscale numbers. The uh, digitalization of the process focused on the extracting of all 3D information uh, present in this very special photograph in such a way that a virtual 3D image could be generated by a computer from it a hologram. The hologram provides an, ex an excellent opportunity to view the image of the shroud in 3D. So you can see over here they've um, basically taken a 3D of the shroud and, and kind of made a representation of that. So what this means guys is the distance between the shroud and the body cannot be produced by an artist and we'll look at more uh, detail of that. Okay here guys is really really important um, evidence of the shroud here. So um, what we have is details in 3D of the shroud and the impression left on it um, had to be uh, 3D. An artist could not have made this impression. Okay, a uh, detailed study of the imprint on the body left on the shroud revealed that it is an, it, its intensity varies gradually by the way which the inversely proportional to the distance between the body and the cloth. The information obtained enabled the development of a three-dimensional picture with the use of various techniques. Okay, then they talk about the techniques of using a micro densityometer. Okay, the reconstruction of the cloth model of the shroud drapes over the body. American uh, physicist John Jackson and his colleagues were able to show that indeed the image intensely does vary with the cloth to body distance with a significant degree of correlation. So that means is when you take the impression, the impression um, has distance between the, the face and the cloth. So um, through uh, computers, they then um, uh, show that here of that distance. So an artist could not have uh, reproduced this. And here you can see computer-aided three-dimensional images of the torture face of the man on the shroud and his truth face and the wounds have been removed. So in this one, the wounds are removed to show more of a three-dimensional of the face, okay? That's it there, that's it here. Okay, let's um, keep going. So the correlation can be um, convincingly demonstrated using special image analysis technique. The idea is to plot the image intensity corresponding to the levels of three-dimensional typographical relief. If this intensity is a shroud and image, it can be correlated to cloth to body distance. Then the resulting relief image should correspond to a, a sensible three-dimensional form in a human body. Um, excluding the second order of the effect of the drape. So Jackson 
Okay. Uh, Jackson uh, later brought a photograph of the shroud to the image for the analysis in the laboratory. Okay. And this is them doing that. And then they, um, the fact that the frontal body image on the shroud is highly correlated with the claw to body distance represents major problems for the hypothesis describing the origin of the shroud image. The three dimensional characteristics of the image argues forcefully that it could not have been the work of an artist. It is interesting to see how the intensities of the various image uh, features in the uh, photograph have been interpreted by the uh, levels of relief, okay? And again, uh, three-dimensional image of the torture face of the man on the shroud. And here is another hologram of the face, um, more representing it in three dimensions. All right, here we have the face. This is the front side of the shroud and the face. And um, what we're looking at here on the imprint of the face, a short trickle of blood in the shape of a verse three caused by the, a lesion in the front, on the frontal vein is visible in the middle of the forehead near the hairline, two small trickles of artery blood uh, come from an injury that was damaged in the frontal part of this of the superficial temporal artery. Okay, so um, of course we have quotations in the Gospels here, and he spat on his face and struck him, and uh, some slapped him, saying, "Prophesy to us, Christ, who is it that struck you?" Matthew, uh, and then they released from them Barnabas having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying, prophesy to us the guards that received him with blows. Okay, so there was a crown of thorns on him. Okay, and this is the evidence of the crown based on what the shroud is showing us. Uh, we'll read some more of those verses. Um, on the back of the neck are several marks similar to those on the forehead can be seen. The thorns, which cause the deep puncture worms of the head, probably damage some parts of the uh, artery and some other deep veins. The blood is, in fact, the um, arterial venous type. Okay. Uh, so here we have the back of the head and the, um, the blood. So that's the back of what the shroud looks like, and that's a more close-up. Okay. Um, okay, and then let's look at more of the verses here in the Gospels. And the soldiers uh, plated a crown of thorns and put it on him. And they struck his head with the reed and spat on him. And the Pilate took Jesus and scorched him. So Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate said, Behold the man. And they took Jesus and went out bearing his own cross to a place called Golgotha, where they crucified him. Okay, so let's um, look some more at this crown of thorns. You can see in the background there's a, uh, a kind of 3D representation of what Christ would have looked like based on the shroud. Um, but this is a, a crown here, and, um, and we can see what it says. Reconstruction of the shroud's spiny helmet. So it was more like a helmet than, you know, what most uh, crowns look like. Okay, and uh, this is a shrub of the small tree rare with the dry parts of Israel. So they also know that based on this, the type of thorns that were in the head, um, and we'll look at other evidence of the, um, the pollen. There's pollen that, that's only in uh, certain parts of the world that was found in the shroud. Okay, so um, spiny tree, it um, dominates the vegetation in Jordan, Dead Sea, uh, Jericho, and Engedi. Okay, so you can take the time to read this. We're gonna, we have a lot of um, things in the exhibit to show you, okay? And as we go around, these are the whips, okay? And you see the balls at the end? Um, 
this is uh, the evidence of that in the shroud. Okay, so guys, this gives us such a vivid picture of the crucifixion. It really, really is moving. Um, you know that Christ died for us. You know, whatever you believe this or not, guys, he died for us. Hey. Oh, excuse me. Okay, um, all right, countless signs of scourging on the back and the lumbar region, crosswise flow of blood, which came from the wound in the chest after the body was taken from the cross. Okay, and more blows. So these, these are evidence of the blows from this whip and the shroud. Blows of the scourge covered the entire body of the crucified man um, with sores. And one person that researched this, they said, I counted more than 100, perhaps 120, okay, of these um, uh, scourges uh, through that, okay? And uh, this is what um, they're, they're marking, they're seeing these, okay, in the shroud, these these points. Uh, the forehand stroke spread fan-like from the shoulders and calves to the legs. Okay, some strokes were backhanded as evidence of the marks of the back. Okay, so these are, these are the signs of this. And again, the, the whip and uh, the, the balls, you can see there's two of them here. One of them has like uh, bones in it. One of them has like balls. Okay, and here's a more of a large scale um, of the entire shroud. And this is what I was showing you in the beginning, the, the size of it. So you saw me um, next to it. Okay, now here is um, an example of crucifixion nails, okay? And this is the key to the house of David, guys, in Isaiah 11, 11. He is a nail. Um, he's nailed in a sure place. And as we keep going, um, we have more evidence of um, what other aspects of the crucifixion details from the shroud, okay? Um, you know, the hands, you know, how, how is it, you know, how is it done? Okay. All right, shown here, you know, let's kind of zoom in. Shown here are two different positions of a man as shown hung on a cross, fallen and raised. The latter adopted the avoid immediate, um, I'm going to skip some of the, the words, you can see them. The wounds caused by the nailing of the cross can be seen in the fold of the wrists and the palms, which could not be supported the weight of the body, in clear contrast with long, um, time artistic representations, okay? So what they're saying here is that the, the uh, nails would have had to gone through, you know, certain uh, parts of the hand. Um, okay, so the nails of the crucifixion, um, the wrists in the space between the bones of the carpus injuring the median nerve, besides the provoking the um, attritious pain, this is um, this would have caused the thumb to be bent over inside the palm, which explains why only four fingers were left in the imprint. Blood flows along the arms from the wrist to indicate two suspension positions on the cross, breaking the legs of the crucified man um, in a rapid death by um, asphyxia. asphyxia. Uh, because he was no longer able to punish to push himself up in order to breathe. The legs of the man in the shroud were not broken as of the fact that Jesus was already dead. Okay. So then he, you know, he's alive at a certain point and then, then um, this is more the, um, the, the dead position right here. Alive, holding himself up and then dead. Okay, and, uh, and that's, this is an excellent exhibit with lots of verses. Um, but there came to Jesus and he saw he was already dead. They did not break his legs. 
For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or comeliness that we should look upon him, no beauty should we desire of him. He was despised, rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and esteemed not. Surely as bore our griefs and has carried our sorrows, we are esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was bruised for our transgression. He was, he was, bru he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastised made of the of us whole with his stripes we are healed so uh now we have um, blood stains uh wound on the side three centimeters wide this wound could conceivably have been caused by the stroke of a lance okay so what what we're saying here is that there's you know like a, a spear coming up and uh and that's um the the uh blood in the side and then the verse here. But one of the soldiers, uh, soldiers opened his side with the lance and immediately there came out blood and water. Okay, a detailed look with the aid of uh, macro photography could, will permit us to observe clear rings in, around the traces of blood due to the exudiation of serum. Okay, so this is just the evidence of the spearing and uh, more of the blood. All right, now in December 1981, three Italian researchers proved the uh, hemetic traces on threads taken from the shroud are of human blood. And in December 82, they came to the conclusion the traces of blood on the shroud are of the AB group. Now in this display, what we have is pollen. So there were hundreds of plants um, and pollen found in the shroud. These are some kind of examples you see in the colors of the pollen. So there's pollen and they took tape and they found that the pollen is really only in the Middle East. Okay, so um, it, it, we can, uh, if you want, you can pause this and you can read more of the detail, but for time's sake, we're going to get into this part right here. Nearly 30 species have been identified virtually from the shroud images. These results show a significant agreement with the studies that took sticky tape samples from the shroud in 1973 and 78 and found many pollen grains on these tapes. Tentatively identified some 88 species, mostly from plants growing in the Near East. Okay, and they allow for identification of the types of the species of pollen grains which have been collected. Okay, so these are some of the types of uh, plants that were found from the pollen of the shroud. Uh, because the boundaries in their distribution areas overlap only in Israel, um, three in particular were identified. Okay, and there's their kind of um, their names. Um, in Jerusalem and Hebron and commonly blooming in the type of three plants occurs in the spring and March. So this is also giving us timing, okay? Three plants occurs in the spring in the months of March and April, of course, at the time of his crucifixion. Very, very strong evidence here of the pollen found in the uh, shroud, okay? And then more, um, of the geographical indications lead the conclusion that fresh flowers from the tree would have been placed near or around the body of the man or the shroud from that area, okay? And then let's continue here on this study. This is very, very um, compelling uh, information from the pollen found in the shroud. Um, so then if we look here, um, it found in Jordan, Sinai, Verification of the pollen grains are present through two kinds of uh, leaf images. They are found in the shroud. The unique leaf pattern development is visible in the shroud. Okay, so there's actual leaves um, and patterns found in the shroud. Okay, and then... Um, okay, so there's more um, above the plant. Um, Morphogra features created experimentally. The rose relief shows prominent um, teeth. Okay, so these are things that were found in even flowers, plant images in the shroud. Plant images in the shroud resemble uh, coronal uh, discharge uh, prints. Okay. 
All right, then uh, we also have this. The image of a loose coil of rope can be seen in the shroud. A curved section of it is visible just at the right and below uh, a replica, which is twisted by ancient manner by um, Professor Dannon. Okay, so they're also showing that there are uh, rope mounts found in the shroud. Okay, and, bef and also the crown of thorns. Um, made with drawings, uh, type of thorn, configuration of the thorn in its location on the right shoulder consigned of the images found on the shroud. Okay, and then more on the plants. Thought was interesting is uh, this display. Um, it's called the Face Cloth of Christ. And um, I'd never heard of this until I, I came to this exhibit. Um, but it's referred to, the Face Cloth of Christ is referred to in John 20, 5 through 8, as one of the um, cloths in his burial. So we know that there was a linen, he was wrapped in a linen cloth. And there was something else called a um, face cloth, which I will... Um, read the actual verse to you, but let's look at this display because this is another one now it's found in Spain. And again, if you find this uh, suspicious, um, just do some research on this and look into it. This one has not had the um, level of intense study, like here's the, a replica of the Shroud of Turin, this is the face cloth. Okay, so in the city of Oviedo in northern Spain, there was a small bloodstained piece of cloth measuring um, 33 inches. Uh, traditionally held to be the cloth that covered the head of Jesus, sometimes referred to as the other shroud. It is more correctly named the Sundarium, S-U-D-A-R-I-U-M. -S okay, so if you want to search that, the face cloth of Christ. Science believe it was a Jewish burial cloth to put, uh, Jewish custom to put such a cloth on the face of the head of a corpse when he was, uh, when the death was so awful that the um, family would not have wanted to see the face set in rigor mortis. A face cloth um, in Latin is sundarium and would have been draped over the head of the crucified Christ while awaiting permission from Pontius Pilate to remove the body. It is referred to in John 25 through 8 in one of the cloths in, in his tomb. The existence of a uh, sudarium and its presence in Ovida is well attested since the 8th century and in Spain since the 7th century. Before these dates, the location of the Sundarium is less certain. But until very re recently, even in Spain, very few people knew about it. However, in 1969, a shroud investigator, um, Riki, um, while going through the church arch, he became aware that there was another cloth in Oviedo and felt it had to be more carefully examined. Because if demonstrated similarities to this shroud, it would be, uh, constitute important collaboration as evidence with the establishment of the Spain Society, the study of the Sundarian Bank in 1987. The linen of the shroud is of fine herma bone weave, but the Sundarian is a rougher weave. Unlike the Shroud of Turin, which has the image of a crucified man, there is no image on the Sundarium, okay? But it, con it contains stains of blood in lip that match the blood type of the shroud. These patterns have been extensively mapped to enable researchers to compare their shape and measurements with those of the shroud. In 99, uh, a member of a multidisciplinary group um, in Spain Center investigated the relationship between the cl two cloths based on the historical sciences, forensic uh, pathology, uh, blood chemistry, um, as AB type blood stains in six parts of pulmonary uh, edema fluid is significant because it indicates that the man died from um, asphyxiation caused by the death of victims for crucifixion. The stain patterns, he concluded that the two cloths covered the same head at two distinct but close measurements of time. So this is um, some, um, you know, evidence of them possibly the same. From the bloodstained patterns, it appears the Sundarium would have been placed on the man's head while he was in a vertical position, okay? Presumably while still hanging on the cross, it would have been removed before the shroud was placed on the body. So they may not have uh, both been on um, at the same time. 
um, and, and, and they also found pollen. Okay, we, we showed you the pollen before. Pollen from North Africa, consistent with the traditional story, the transfer from Jerusalem via Alexandria, Alexandria to Spain, later to Toledo, finally in 78 to Oviedo. The shroud lacks this pollen, but has pollen grain specific to Turkey and France, which are not present in this one. So they had different routes um, to their present locations. Um, the shroud going through Turkey and France, and this one going through North Africa. The Sundarium is currently kept in the Camara Santa, the chapel built specifically for it um, as a cathedral. Around the world, several copies of the shroud are known. Not a single one of them, however, is a um, photographic negative. Okay, and then here's a shroud. Okay, guys, I just wanted to conclude our uh, presentation on the Shroud of Turin. Um, I hope that you uh, found this um, enlightening. Um, I would also like to include um, some footage of the uh, garden tomb because in the garden tomb there is, uh, you know, of course, other evidence that that's the authentic place and the uh, linen cloth as well mentioned, I believe, in the um, Gospel of John. Um, so, guys, thanks, thank you for watching. Um, I hope that, you know, this isn't, a, a, you know, something to try to prove anything. Um, we're doing this to say, Jesus Christ died for you. Um, his blood was shed for our sins, and that we should uh, believe in him and have faith in what he's done as a redemption of our sins. So I'm doing this to encourage your faith, to witness to Christ's death, burial, and resurrection as the Son of God. Amen.